Thank you again for the opportunity to uh, come and speak to everyone today. Uh, so we're here to talk about accessibility uh, and why we do it, what's the purpose of it. A lot of you have come because there's a new law being introduced in the province of Quebec and you want to know what you need to do to become compliant to it. But what we're hoping to do and this afternoon is give you a bit of a different perspective on accessibility. Um, to remind you really why we do it, it's not just to meet the law, but there's an audience out there that uh, needs accessibility accommodations. And the reason why we design with universal design in mind, universal inclusion in mind and things like that, is to meet the needs of everyone out there, meet the needs of the widest possible audience. So as I go through my speech, keep that in mind. Um, I'd also ask that you keep um, in mind that everyone has a story told. And when you consider accessibility, remember that there's a whole variety of different folks out there. Some have uh, some interesting stories, some are not so interesting, and some are kind of extraordinary. And you can decide what, what, mine falls, what category mine falls into at the end of uh, this discussion. So yeah, first I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, AMI. We're one of the uh, sponsors today. We're sponsoring the uh, facilitation this afternoon. And the, uh, oh, the hope is that there's going to be quite the animated discussion as, as we go through that. I'm going to tell you a bit about what we do. So accessible media, AMI, if you haven't heard us, um, our mandate is to make media accessible to all Canadians. We have two services which you may have heard of. One is the accessible channel, otherwise known as TAC TV. The other is voice print. Uh, here in Montreal, you can find TAC TV on channel 27 on Videotron. It is uh, both TAC TV and voice print um, hold a unique status with the CRTC, um, specifically 91H status. So it's a must carry status. So if you have a digital television, digital television subscription in the country, then you have our channel on your TV. Um, so we are uh, on every television set. Voice print is also out there as well. Um, I believe in Quebec you can find it on the SAP channel on CBC News World. Um, and what these two services are, are to meet the needs of visually impaired and hearing impaired Canadians. We, uh, TAC TV is 100% described. Uh, the soundtrack never ends every minute of the day. Uh, it's also 100% captioned, open captioned specifically. So when you log on, when you turn onto the channel, you will see the captions there displayed right away. You don't actually need to turn them on. Voice print is an audio reading service. It's uh, been around for about more than 20 years. And it was established to meet the needs of visually impaired Canadians, um, to provide that social inclusion that everyone would be, accept, everyone would have access to the daily news. So we report a variety of different news articles from magazines and newspapers. Uh, we pull information from from over the internet, and we have volunteers come into our offices all across the country uh, each day to read the news and we digitize it and we put it up on the voice print, on, on AMI.ca specifically. Um, and it is also on the voice print channel on the SAP setting uh, and also on its own channel on uh, other cable systems across the country. So those are the two services of what we do. We are also getting into more of a uh, digital perspective. Uh, we're working uh, to establish a variety of standards for web and mobile and things like that. So please do check us out at ami.ca. Um, and I see our, our Twitter address is not showing up, but do follow us at A11Y Media on Twitter. So I'm going to get into a bit of the uh, presentation. And as I said, this is a, uh, it's a story to remind you about what we do and why we're here. Um, I'm gonna talk a bit about my experience. Um, I have a physical disability on my left arm and as you may be able to see from my hand um, and it's this is the story behind that and how I got to where I am today so just bear with me one moment so to to begin with um, I'm gonna start with a few disclaimers uh, and a bit of background on the story to start. Um, if, you're, oh, oh. 
If you're at all squeamish about anything medically related, specifically blood in any amount, then you may have some difficulties with this story. Um, I'll just get it right out there right away. Uh, some of the things I'm about to describe to you are extraordinary and at times graphic, and I just want you to be aware of that beforehand. Uh, the second is that I am healthy. I'm more healthy at this age than I, was, than I was when I was a kid. However, there's absolutely no medical explanation as to why. When these events were taking place, I wrote about them, and I kept a blog and have since compiled the entries into the format of a book. Uh, however, that book has yet to find a purpose beyond it just being a full compilation of my thoughts during this time. The events that took place were extraordinary, and many people have encouraged me to do so something more with the story, such as speaking about it, given my occupation and, in the, and, the understanding of the, uh, and understanding of the needs of those who may require a different accommodation. And actually, just before I start, I feel I should actually tell you a bit more about myself. I neglected to do that. Um, I have, uh, prior to AMI, I have worked with the federal government and the uh, provincial government uh, in Ontario in the area of accessibility. Um, I've also, uh, once upon a time, John Folio and myself actually worked at a technology training school back at the end of the 1990s, around the time that the first W3C standards uh, came about. So I've been involved in accessibility a long time. Um, in Ontario, I was a member of the AODA's Information and Communication Standard Development Committee. Uh, so I had some experience in, uh, in what we're here to initially start discussing today is bringing in that provincial standard and really understanding uh, what you need to do to become compliant to it in all regards and who you're doing it for. Um, I've also had some experience in the insurance industry, but I also now that I've moved to AMI, uh, the opportunities to adopt accessibility on a much greater scale um, are there. Uh, and, and so let me uh, get into it. Uh, so the word impossible um, comes up all the time in terms of accessibility. Uh, there's such terrible connotations to the word. It's limiting. It puts up a roadblock. It defines an end and it defines an ex uh, the extent of what can be achieved. I refuse to believe that there is a defined end to what is possible. So much can be achieved that was once considered to be impossible. In my career, I've had the opportunity to work with organizations large, as, large and small, as well as various levels of government. As a director of accessible digital media at a, with AMI, my focus is accessibility from the digital perspective, along with the creation of standards. In this role, I've had the opportunity to position AMI as a media voice for accessibility. I've worked in the web accessibility industry since it began, really, and as many of you will be able to understand, uh, I've come across the word impossible when it's related to accessibility more than once. And that gave me the idea to uh, build this presentation around that. Uh, we don't have the time, we don't have the money, we don't have the desire to meet the needs of the audience. Uh, we don't feel as if we have to meet the law um, that has come into place. <clears throat> it's impossible to build this website to ensure it's accessible. And really impossible becomes a definition of the extent to what can be achieved in the worst way to the point of exclusion and even discrimination. You'll see this in the types of technology that you use to meet the needs, the digital needs of your audience. Years ago, before the introduction of any types of standards, the internet was a playground for those who required no special accommodation. Throughout more than the last decade, though, we've seen the adoption of standards and the further development of assistive technology tools to assist with the inclusion of everyone. However, the adoption of technology accessibility standards and the development of these tools is far from complete. The reality is that as technology continues to evolve, so too must the adoption of accessibility considerations in order to continue and further meet the needs of the widest possible audience. Essentially, know your audience and know their needs. Design and test your content to ensure that the same user experience is available to everyone regardless of their abilities. Test for accessibility coding issues, test for usability, and conduct an intuitive analysis without the use of any technology at all. Recognize that there are standards and being, co and being compliant to them is not only a business differentiator, but it's quite simply the right thing to do. As with all things, you have to want it in order to achieve it, and if you don't, then you give in to all the connotations that come along with the word impossible. So it feels like we're going into a time where accessibility will be recognized unlike ever before. 
Uh, we're meeting here today to discuss the, new, the introduction of new standards, which is recognition in itself that something was missing in the past. At AMI, we're uniquely positioned to be a media voice for accessibility during this new time and beyond on the accessible channel and voice print. Our mandate is to make media accessible to all Canadians. We also understand that an important part of our work will, will be in recognizing that everyone has a story to be told. Organizations that understand accessibility and the need for it begin to share the unique perspective of those who may require a different ac an accommodation. Many of you present today and the organizations that you represent will share that perspective. It's really why you've come today. The community that requires accessibility has been patient long enough. It is time to meet their needs and ensure that no one is left behind. Everyone feels included and the world becomes a more accessible place. I'd like to draw upon the example of traveling abroad. At some point, you may have found yourself traveling in a foreign country. I've had the opportunity to travel myself to more than 50 countries so far, and I can tell you that as a Canadian in a foreign land, uh, well alone in a foreign country, to find a person who, f um, I've had the opportunity to do that, and I can tell you that as a Canadian, it is very comforting, well alone in a foreign country, to find another person who flies their flag on your, on, flies your flag on their backpack. Upon doing so, immediately you have a connection. You have a unique understanding that only the both of you as Canadians in a foreign land can understand. You both know what it is to be Canadian and what your daily lives are like and how you may go about your day-to-day -day activities. Perhaps you can see where I'm going with this. I will not say for one moment that I fully understand how a person with a specific disability relates to another with that same disability in the experiences that they've had in their lives. However, however, I will indicate more broadly that a person who needs accessibility accommodations certainly has an understanding of those who also require an, a, a special accommodation. I can say that in my own experience, having a medical condition that is so unique, I rarely meet another who has had the same accessibility experiences as I, but I feel the sense of community. There's power in numbers, and there's a power and a common purpose to serve those who need accessibility. Everyone has a story to be told, and this is mine. So I'll tell you a bit more about myself before I start. I, uh, I'm 35, married uh, from Toronto. Um, I've been married for about four years. Uh, we're just expecting our first child. And if there's one thing I sometimes reflect on is the meaning of the words that you speak to your spouse on your wedding day. In sickness and in health, till death do us part, uh, on that day, you really have no idea what those words mean. Uh, it is not until you weather the storm of in sickness together that you understand the importance to love, comfort, and keep each other when times are good. So I'll ask you now to picture, if you will, what's displayed up on the screen right now, and I will read it for those who are unable to, uh, to see it, is an excerpt from an email that my mother wrote once upon a time. So it reads, two years ago, a young man, age 32, um, actually, I just turned 35, so it was in three years ago now, uh, lies in a bed in, a card in the cardiac intensive care ward. He is unconscious. A ventilator helps him breathe. A dialysis machine is cleaning his blood, and there are 14 bags of drugs hanging above him with leads into his intravenous. This is the 10th transfusion in the past 10 weeks. There will be 12 more. The crash cart is beside the bed. He has been shocked 12 times. There will be 13 more times. And two weeks ago, he had heart failure, which then resulted in the failure of his kidneys, lungs, and his liver. Since that time, he has almost died three times. The doctors tell his wife and his parents that he will probably live, but this, being unconscious and on life support, may be, <clears throat> may be as good as it will get. As you can see, not so much. Um, so... I'm going to turn that off for the moment and just sort of leave you with that as I continue uh, through my story. And uh, I will turn it back on a little later. Um, I don't remember what happened during that time. Uh, what I do remember is waking up and then the journey which then started and to be able to lift my arm. I couldn't lift my arm, but I have quite a bit of functionality uh, on it right now. Uh, then to talk, I, I couldn't speak when I woke up, eventually to sit up and sit on the edge of the bed, and finally to stand and with much effort to walk. However, before we get to all that, I'd like to set the context for the story of how we got there. 
Um, I was born with a unique condition, although no one knew that at the time. I had too many arteries. At one time, I had more than 50 arteries in my left arm. You're only supposed to have three. I don't anymore, however, have 50, um, although I do still have more than the average person. Uh, when I was 17, I had surgery on my arm, but it only worsened the situation. No one really knew what the problem was, let alone how to treat it. As I came into my 20s, that mass on my left arm began to grow. And it also grew into my side and up into the base of my neck. Finally, it was diagnosed as an arterial venous malformation, an AVM. Fairly rare. Very few cases have ever been diagnosed. People usually have one of these in their brain or on a, on a lower extremity. Uh, rarely is it in the arm and rarely is it very large. Mine, to this day, remains one of the largest ever diagnosed anywhere in the world. Uh, in my early 20s, I had two embolizations. This is a process whereby large arteries are closed with the application of essentially me <clears throat> medical grade crazy glue. Um, I visited the Mayo Clinic three times, but they said the situation was not life-threatening and doing nothing was best. <clears throat> By my mid-twenties, the bump on my arm, while large and growing, was stable. I had the opportunity to travel extensively and live abroad, uh, and also work abroad. One moment I will always recall is walking out of an airport in Cambodia and being swarmed by a group of young poor children who simply wanted to rub their hands on the bump on my arm. They had never seen anything like it, of course. At the time, that was one of the strangest experiences I had had on my arm. Little did I know there was so much more to come. At the end of 2005, I had a break in the skin where the bump is located. Bandages remain on my arm today, covering what is left of that original wound. Little did I know at the time that the scratch on my arm would become the source of so much blood, tears, and pain over the years. Now patience is really like an old friend, really ever-present and always there. Moving into 2006, the wound began to grow. The blood supply through my arm was so extensive that the body could not heal itself. Arteries in my arm burst through the wound three times in 2006. Picture, if you will, a water fountain. Uh, you turn on the tap and the water arcs across the tray so that you can get a drink. Uh, literally the same situation applied. Uh, blood shot out of my arm through the wound, through clothing, uh, and arc just like the spout on a water fountain. And I will always recall the feeling that my life may be ending as, I, as the blood pumped out of my body with each beat of my heart. Um, a solution needed to be found. At the time, doctors in Canada didn't have the experience <clears throat> to be able to appropriately treat my condition. However, there were doctors in the U.S. that had become leaders in the field at a, at, uh, at a hospital called the Vascular, Birth, Vascular and Birthmark Institute in New York. We applied to the healthcare system for out-of-country coverage and were denied. Um, however, as my condition continued to deteriorate, with successive bleeds, I did receive approval to travel out of the country for these procedures. And I had three embolization surgeries in New York up to the beginning of 2007. We thought that the problem was solved. Then it was a time for stability. We were getting married that year in September 2007, and there was much to do. Things remained stable until June 4th, 2008. That day, I sat at my desk. It was early afternoon. Suddenly, my arm felt strange and warm. It had been bandaged since the surgeries finished at the beginning of 2007. Even after the embolizations in New York, the original wound had never really quite healed itself. I decided that I walk across the floor of the uh, building in which I worked to the washroom and go and check to make sure that, the, that my arm was okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, re I can recall entering the room, stepping up to the basins, raising my left arm up and raising my left arm up towards the mirror. Then my arm exploded. It wasn't a water fountain anymore. It was more like the crack in a dam. I lost an extraordinary amount of blood that day. My red blood cell count dropped by half and would not return to normal levels for 15 months. During the lunch, during the lunch hour that day, I had called a coworker of mine from my cell phone. Her name is Joy. As I began to fill a sink basin with my own blood, I retrieved my BlackBerry and hit send and send again to redial the last number I had called. I told her I needed help. And as I collapsed on the floor, I was able to call my wife and tell her that I loved her as my, as my blood began to cover the walls and the floor. Joy arrived, as did many others. 
through it all until the paramedics came. They did their best to stabilize me. And she sat with me, wrapping anything she could find around my arm to stop the bleeding. She herself covered in my blood. She prayed over me and sang to me and kept me there in that room on that bathroom floor. Of all the numerous times I've nearly passed away during this story, and there has been many, uh, it was then that I truly felt that I came the closest to slipping away. If you want to survive, you can. You simply have to want it enough. Uh, little did we know, though, that still, the story was only just beginning. Throughout the summer of 2008, there were six more explosive bleeds of this nature um, before we reached September of that year. We were out for dinner one time when it happened, and I ran outside of the uh, restaurant that we were in, and after someone had called 911, the police came and closed the street. Um, and if you're familiar with Toronto, it's actually Bloor Street. Um, so they closed Bloor Street because they believed I'd been shot uh, because there was that much blood. Uh, by that point, though, we defined a triage solution. Blood pressure cuff to the bicep, pump it as far as it'll go so that it acts as a tourniquet. It's frightening how clear-minded and logical one can be as you spill liter after liter of blood out of your body and onto the ground. Now that I think about it, though, I always looked for a receptacle for that blood just to lessen the mess. We then came to September, and it was a point of frustration and giving in. No solution really could be found, and it was decided that the only way to close the wound was to remove the arm itself, amputation. As you can see, again, not so much. Um, of course, there was no way to know if the resulting wound from that would heal, but it seemed that that was the only solution. So I mentally prepared myself. I spoke with persons who had received similar amputations <coughs> around my age, and I even toured a prosthetics factory. In the end, I was ready. One thought really remained to me at the time, though, and it, and it was how could it have possibly come to this? What mistakes were made in this fight over so many years, or was it just simply a case of being what it is? On October 1st, 2008, I went in for the amputation surgery. When they're amputating your limb, they don't put you on a table. It's more of a reclining chair, and then they strap you in. The orthopedic surgeon that did the surgery is one of the kindest and most caring medical professionals I will ever know. He's someone who truly cares for your well-being. As the room was locked down for the surgery, he put on my favorite song while I fell asleep. He had found the song on my Facebook page. Um, he had 20 liters of blood standing by, as it was presumed that my blood loss during the surgery would be significant. However, in the end, it, I only lost 30 milliliters, and as you can see, the arm is still there. The doctor was able to cut off and tie off over 50 arteries in my left forearm, <coughs> creating a new wound that spanned most of the length of my forearm. Problem solved, or at least we thought. What we didn't count on was the arteries going the other way, towards my heart, even though this was never proven. Over the next couple of months, my health began to decline once again, and by the time of January 2009, I could do really very little. One of the last things I did in what I think of now as my last life uh, was go to a concert. Perhaps you're familiar with the, the Killers, the musical group The Killers. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, it was a killer song that played as I fell asleep from my uh, amputation. Little did I know that the, this concert would really act as a guidepost between one life and the next. On February 8th, 2009, I had heart failure. Thankfully, that is the time at which my memory stops. On February 5th, they discovered that I had fluid around my heart. On February 7th, I had heart surgery, and they removed 2.34 liters of blood from the pericardial sac around my heart. You're supposed to have none. To <clears throat> this day, no one knows why the blood was there, or really why my heart even failed. I was unconscious and sedated for 25 days, in the hospital for a total of 90 days, 45 of them in intensive care. I almost died three times while in the hospital and went into arterial fibrillation hundreds of times. Apparently one night I unconsciously tore the ventilator out, damaging my vocal cords. However, my voice has now returned to where it was before. It was somewhat different initially. Uh, after I woke up, my mind would wander a lot, and I had difficulty distinguish distinguishing my dreams from reality. They call it ICU psychosis, because when you're in the ICU, you never sleep, uh, and so you never reach that state of sleep. And I was in there for 45 days. After I woke up, they took my ventilator out, <clears throat> but had to put it back in it because I still couldn't breathe on my own. I have a clear memory of one call of a code blue and the arrival of the crash cart, um, it came many times, 
and the application of drugs and shock that essentially pressed the reset button on my heart. On one other occasion, I can recall watch, watching a monitor as my heart rate went slower and slower for 60, then 50, 45, 40, 35, 30. And then 30 was the last number that I ended up seeing. Apparently, my heart rate went down to 29. And at that point, my blood pressure was 35 over 11. Um, I lost about 75 pounds while I was unconscious, and I was able to keep it off. <laughs> I couldn't move from my bed when I woke up. In fact, I couldn't even raise my arm because I was too weak. Um, I had to gradually strengthen my arm so that I could lift it. Gradually, I learned to sit up and then sit on the edge of the bed. I still couldn't walk, though. Um, after I could sit up and was out of intensive care and on the cardiac ward, uh, they put me in a harness attached to the ceiling to lift me out of bed and into a wheelchair for my one trip to the washroom each day. That was my big outing. The first time I looked in the mirror after 35 days, I sat in front of it in a wheelchair and simply stared. I'd grown a beard. They didn't shave it off because they wanted to uh, assist me with the understanding of how much time had passed um, since I had been unconscious. And my face was quite emaciated. One of the first tasks in my rehabilitation was the process of overcoming ICU psychosis. Uh, it was a process of naming things and then having someone tell me real or not real. Uh, I couldn't remember my phone number. I couldn't remember the inside of what my car looked like. I couldn't remember even where I lived. Uh, I couldn't remember how to use my Blackberry uh, and was confused by very uh, many things. Eventually though, I gained more mobility and I began to think of what I now think of as this life. Um, I was able to get outside. Um, however, after you've been inside, breathing recirculated and air-conditioned air for uh, an extended period of time, it's fairly difficult to breathe once you actually step outside again. I got better and then got worse. I was in the ICU a total of three times. Um, I had a pacemaker installed during one of these visits, but that hardware only serves just the purpose of a backup today, uh, a role much smaller than it held in the past. During this time, really, two things became clear. Uh, first, the support of friends and family is utterly important to an extensive rehabilitation. Nearly every person I know came to visit me during that time, my, and my parents lived in a hospital. Uh, they were from out of town, so they lived in a hospital, uh, in a hotel near the hospital for nearly 60 days. Uh, and entire congregations across the country prayed for my health and well-being, and, and that in itself needs to be acknowledged. Uh, secondly, the other thing is you have to want it to get it. One of the requirements for me to be able to leave the hospital was to walk up 14 stairs. Uh, I had just begun to learn to walk again, though, on my own, and climbing upstairs was going to be the next challenge. One of the greatest things my father has ever done for me uh, was to bring me to a hospital stairwell. He, the, here he drove me and commanded me up those stairs one by one. First five, then a full flight, then two flights, and before I checked out, I could do 70 steps or 70 full flights. Oh, I'm sorry, seven full flights. Um, you'll be familiar with the CN Tower uh, in Toronto. I made, I had been this whole, staying this whole time in the Toronto General Hospital just down the street from the CN Tower, and I, I made a promise to myself that as I sat in the hospital down the street from the tower that I would uh, do the walk up it one day, um, which I do plan to do in the future, but I figured I would start with the uh, new attraction that they have where you can walk around the outside of the uh, CN Tower at the top, and I'm going to be doing that next week. Um, eventually, though, I did get out of the hospital in early May. My wife bought a new condo during that time. Uh, we had to move because we had too many uh, stairs in our last place, and I wasn't going to be able to walk up any stairs. Uh, in the summer, though, I was admitted to the hospital again for two more weeks. I had begun to retain fluid and gained 25 pounds of water weight uh, back on because my kidneys were not still functioning properly. Uh, back in the hospital, though, I lost it all in 25 days. Then at the end of the July, I had another surgery, and then in August, another decision had to be made. My arm wasn't healing, and it was decided that the only way to fully re rehabilitate was to once again consider the, the uh, possibility of amputation. Re and, and it's just, how could it possibly have come to this again? In fact, after much reflection and the evidence put before me, I did actually make the decision that it was the correct course of action, and I began the process to look into going in for the amputation a second time. However, that was all it took for my brain and my body to, uh, to kick into gear. Um, it was time to fix this. And by the beginning of 2009, the switch had been flipped. Uh, blood, my red blood cell count returned to normal. My body began to stabilize, and my arm began at long last to heal. 
Uh, went to another Killers concert that month, thereby marking the next guidepost between one life and the next. And, and I was able to do more and more as time went by through the remainder of 2009. Spent the holidays with family, and as we collectively raised our middle finger to the year that was, and welcomed in the prospect of so much new potential in 2010. Then in early 2010, my wife and I joined my parents on a, on a cruise in the Caribbean for 10 days, and shortly after, I returned to my job, initially part-time, but still in somewhat fragile state. It may be of interest to some that the total cost of my health care uh, during all this time is estimated to be at more than $1 million, uh, but of course every cent of which was covered by the Canadian health care system. At this point, it's really beyond medical explanation. Uh, we keep doing what we're doing and stay the course. Uh, I'm doing physiotherapy and looking into plastic surgery for my hand. Uh, they've opened a new clinic at the hospital to treat people with my condition as they are now able to diagnose and detect the condition more easily with what they've learned from me. Bandages remain on my arm, but the wound is just the size of the original scratch, um, just the size of a fingernail now. Uh, telling the story, as I've been doing, has also been a part of the healing process. Soon, though, there will come a day when we're able to write the end of the story. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. And I wanted to tell you a bit about what I've learned through this process um, and how I really relate it back to what I do. Um, certainly, patience is key uh, at the top of the list. Um, I've had a wound on my arm for five years, and I'm simply waiting it out. Uh, I know that uh, my, my brain tells me that one day it will be healed, and I believe it. And uh, I just simply have to wait around until it's done. And it is almost there. So good things come to those who wait, and you simply have to have the patience to wait it out. The next certainly is appreciation. Um, one of the, I, as I said, I've traveled quite a bit, but one of the most sweetest liquids I will have ever tasted is a glass of cold ice water that I got uh, in the Toronto, Hosp Toronto General Hospital when I was first able to walk to the water filtration system uh, machine on my own and, and get myself a glass of water. Um, and the other is outside air. Um, one of the things I've, I've always said is take a big deep breath of fresh air when you walk into a building the next time because you really don't know when the next time is that you'll be able to take one again. Um, and that was one of the biggest things that sort of haunted me throughout the uh, whole process. Understand your emotions and your instincts. Um, the key is to put it behind you. Reflect on it and know, understand what you learned from it and then move on. Uh, if you don't, you'll never be able to do so. Um, the next is survive. Um, always uh, keep survival as your last instinct because if you do, then um, it will always be the last thing that you do. Um, fear nothing. Say it like it is and accept that it is what it is and really prosper and prevail rather than perish from the pain. So use, use the pain as a, as a means to push yourself forward, really. <laughs> love the ones you love. Love them as much as you possibly can and keep your friends and family close. Absolutely key throughout the whole process. Um, and quite simply, you have to want it. Um, just as all, with all things, you have to want it in order to achieve it. Um, if you don't, then what really is the point? Uh, and finally, why not be extraordinary? Really, anything is possible. You can do it if you want to. You just have to simply have the intent to do so. So make your mark, because anything is possible. And I say that because anything is um, Next time someone tells you that accessibility is impossible, tell them they're wrong. I mean, there's so many reasons why um, it's possible and you can do it. You simply have to, to have the desire to do so. Um, if you don't, then you give in to all of the connotations that come along with the word impossible. Personally, I've never uh, accepted the definition of the word. I prefer to define it as this. And that's it. Thank you very much.